Hello there and welcome once again to The Verdict. I'm Mick Cornett along with Kent Myers. We're here every week meeting interesting people and dealing with topical issues. And today we deal with one of Oklahoma's most treasured landmarks. Yes, it's a very special show for us and for our guests. I know uh, the, we're going to deal with the 20th anniversary <coughs> of the Oklahoma City bombing and more particularly with a focus on the Oklahoma City National Memorial. We're going to have two guests that know all about it and know what's going on and are just doing a marvelous job for really the showpiece of Oklahoma City in, in a somber, reflective way, and, but a very important way. Yeah, so I, th I think our viewers will uh, enjoy it. I think our viewers will hear some things that they may not know. It has grown and matured as our memories have as well. It's all coming up today on The Verdict. Stay with us. I can offer is insight into understanding the Native American art, how these artists are expressing themselves as cultural people. I am Heather Ottone. I'm a Native American researcher and curator, and I am Chickasaw. I can remember in first grade the teacher saying, well, you're so lucky you don't look Indian. That was difficult to hear because it was what I was, it's what I am. I think there's a renaissance going on amongst the tribes. I think the Chickasaws are leading that. We didn't die. We're not gone. So what are we now? And what can we do now to start to form that identity, to survive into another century? And to have the culture guiding us into that future, that would be significant. See more stories about the Chickasaw people at profilesofanation.com. Of the verdict, Mick Cornett with Kent Myers. Kent's going to introduce today's guests. Today, we're really honored to have on the verdict uh, two individuals who are deeply involved in the Oklahoma City National Memorial. To my right is uh, Carrie Watkins. Carrie is the executive director of the Oklahoma City National Memorial. She began in 1996 as the very first employee uh, working with the uh, memorial and has been there ever since. Prior to that time, uh, she was, well, I should say she still continues to be, an award-winning journalist uh, and uh, has, was named executive director in 1999 and has served since that time. Uh, she's recognized nationally for her work uh, making the Oklahoma City National Memorial really something powerful and special. And this is her first visit to the verdict. Carrie, welcome. Thank you. Sure glad to have you. Thank you very much. Uh, to my left is the chairman of the board of the Oklahoma City National Memorial, Susan Winchester. Uh, Susan, um, <clears throat> like Carrie, has a very distinguished career in a number of different areas uh, in her service in the legislature, her uh, uh, wonderful activities with the Children's Matters, and uh, her service on the board of the Oklahoma City National Memorial. 2006, she was named Oklahoma Woman of the Year by the Journal Record. Uh, she served in the House. Uh, for 10 years in District 47 and then chose to do other things. Uh, she's been active in children's matters for a number of years and was uh, inducted into the Oklahoma Institute for Child Advocacy Hall of Fame. This is likewise her first visit. Susan, glad to have you. Thank you so much. Now, Susan, let's start with you. As chairman of the board of the National Memorial, what, what is your role? to help Carrie, <laughs> more or less to do what Carrie tells us to do. We have a, a wonderful board, very engaged, very dedicated to the memorial, um, very active committees. 
the financial committee, education committee, we're working on reaccreditation. We just try to make things, we, we bring in outside help to make sure that everything's running the way it should. And, but, oh, go ahead. And, and, and Carrie, there's so many things that go on beyond just the keeping the grounds looking as, as, as pristine as you keep them. So many programs. Do you want to kind of give us an overview of your role as executive director? Well, I mean, our goal is to, to be the guardians of the, of the memorial and the museum. So, you know, with the recent um, enhancements of the museum, we are kind of relooking at all of our programs and are in the midst of designing an incredible learning lab for the end of the museum for students that will give them hands-on technology to learn science, technology, engineering, and math, which all related back to the story of the bombing. So that's kind of our focus right now. We still do a first person, which allows someone like Susan who lost someone in the bombing or a survivor or a rescue worker to come in and talk to groups. Um, and we have all kinds of educational programs out in the schools. But we're really proud of just of trying to stay relevant 20 years later, making sure that this story that we're teaching a new generation, they know what happened and what we learned from it. Susan, uh, when did you first start your service with the memorial? Um, I don't, uh, as far as the board, I truthfully don't remember. I, I think the first thing I ever did for the memorial was in the legislature. Mm -hmm. The first bill that I ever had signed was to allow you to give your tax refund, your Oklahoma tax refund, mm -hmm. as a donation to the memorial. What size board is it? Uh, Approximately. 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 43. Wow. And how are they selected? How are the board members selected? Oh, we have family members, we have rescue workers, we have survivors, we have people from just the community, we have people f that serve on a statewide basis, a general spectrum of, of the population of Oklahoma, and then we have an, an, a national advisory board as well. Uh, on the, uh, the board that, you're cha that you chair, mm -hmm. is it a pretty hands-on board? Do they know what's going on and are they involved? I hope so. They're engaged? very, very involved. Everyone yeah. has an opportunity to do as much as, as they're willing to do. A lot of opportunity, particularly this month or, or during the month of April. I think yeah. there was more than they had probably thought they, they could, ha could be a part of. Yeah. Carrie, what, what, um, on the, the week of the bombing, uh, obviously that's on the 19th, but you have a series of events. Kind of take us through the week, not just in 2015, but what you try to do every year. Well, we always t t try to take time to remember in some scale. I think, you know, that could change as we move forward. but. This year was larger than normal. On, on the day before the, the anniversary of this year, we had a two, almost 2,000 motorcycles that came from uh, at Western Oklahoma City to, to the memorial site and uh, led by Governor Fallon, and it was a remarkable site, and they raised $50-some thousand dollars for the memorial, and they do that annually. That's grown from two or 300 bikes to nearly 2,000. So that was remarkable, and it, it brings, it was started by a wind and fire group of retired firefighters and it's just grown and it's just been really neat to watch that group come together. And also this year we had a reunion um, on the floor of the Chesapeake Arena where uh, people who were coming back, family members, survivors, mainly rescuers who had not been back in 20 years, came back to a completely different city. A new arena, a new NBA arena, um, really a new city. And to hear the, the attorneys that tried the case, prosecuted the case, and defended the case and the rescue workers, these folks had not been back to Oklahoma City 15 years at least. They couldn't believe the city in which they flew into. I mean, they absolutely, mm -hmm. that was kind of the talk of their weekend. And then um, that was a remarkable afternoon where families and friends saw each other, hadn't seen each other, had, hadn't caught up, and it was, it was really hopeful and promising, and I think it was, it was a good afternoon for them. And then Sunday morning, you know, President Clinton was here, you, you joined us for that. On the, on the site to, just to remember, just to take time to remember, uh, to hear how far we'd come as a city. And I think that's something we can't forget. I mean, my kids are being raised in a city much different than which I came to uh, OU. And we can't lose sight of how far we've come or how we got there or mm -hmm. we're likely to go backwards. And so I think the unity of the city is something we try to talk about a lot. And I think President Clinton did a nice job of recognizing that as well. And that's just a message we want out there so that people realize hadn't always been this hip and cool, and we've got to make sure we stay that way. <laughs> and I think that's an important part of the relevancy of the museum is making sure people realize the lessons we learned from the bombing and, mm -hmm. and what the good that came out of the very very worst. The Reflections of Hope uh, event. Take, take our, our, our viewers through that event and the thinking behind it. Well, Susan and I, I mean, we, we, we began to do these oral histories a couple of years ago with members of the prosecution, the defense, 
um, investigators. And every time you would interview a prosecution, we obviously went to them first because they were the easiest to get. I mean, they, you know, they they were easily to to acquire. And you'd sit down with those great attorneys, and they would say, "You got to go talk to this one or this one." But every single one of them would say. We were only as good as the defense. I mean, we could not prosecute this case if, if the government had not assembled a great defense team, on both McVeigh and Nichols. And so as we began to look at this annual award, we kind of threw out there, should we honor the prosecution and, and defense? And our executive committee said, you've got to honor them both. I mean, you have to honor both the prosecution and defense. And, and, and really the judges, so that you know that the, the, the process of the court mm -hmm. really is what made brought justice. I mean, if you like it or not, it, it was, you know, three juries made these decisions. And so we went to the prosecution defense and the judges, five judges, about 45 members of the prosecution defense. And we had a little over, we had half of those folks here on April 20th and honored them. So on the stage were members of prosecution defense, really in alphabetical order. So you had, you know, a Stephen Jones standing next to a Pat Ryan, whatever. I mean, it was, they were, everyone was on the stage together. And I think we've heard more about that. Just how and it's it, been so positive. It's yeah. been so positive. Just the fact that we did it and that we we recognized not one yeah. but both. It's of the kind teams. of unprecedented, isn't it? I it mean, really have, is. have other events ever taken on an assignment like that? I don't think so. I, mean, I think that the attorneys, both on both sides, you know, were were pretty um, in awe about it. I got a couple of letters from members of, of the teams that you know didn't feel like they should be recognized or rewarded for it. And really it was just recognition of mm -hmm. the fact that they gave up, those guys, ladies and gentlemen, gave up years of their life. I mean, of course they were paid for, but you know, Stephen Jones took on the most hated criminal in the United States at the time. Michael Tiger, again, I mean, his teams did. It wasn't, they didn't have to do that. Mm -hmm. Yet they did it and, and then it was up to the government to prove the case and the government did. But, um, but also that, there was a tear between, you know, moving that case out of the U.S. Attorney's Office in Oklahoma City to the Justice Department and having the local office involved some, I mean greatly, but not to the point where they ran it all. And that was a little bit of a rub that we addressed head on and, and we deal with that in the museum as to why that was done. And that's a, that's a story that I think brought great healing to the people who were in the U.S. Attorney's Office who had felt maybe, not really slighted, but maybe overlooked the fact that they weren't strong enough to do it. And it really wasn't about that. It was about the fact that we did not have a confirmed U.S. attorney at the, the day of the bombing. And they just wanted to make sure there was no reason for appeals down the road. And so they brought in some strong attorneys that worked alongside our folks here. And it's that alone was unprecedented. Mm -hmm. Let's take a break. We'll get back more. We're discussing the Oklahoma Memorial, the 20th anniversary of the Oklahoma City bombing. Took place in our city just last month. We'll be back with more after this. It's a North American energy revolution. We're the fastest growing source of new oil and natural gas supplies in the world. The shift to North American energy will create approximately three million jobs. All that money we've been sending overseas, $400 billion a year. Imagine that staying in our economy. It's a game changer. Real energy independence starts now. And it starts with Oklahoma. The good life comes naturally to Tulsa, where nature's beauty is matched with an eye for aesthetics. A legacy of neighborhoods graced with lawns and landscaping and handsome homes. A place that seems to have patented an ideal lifestyle. Bank First is loyal to the quality of life Tulsa assures its citizens, to the priority placed on education, culture, and growth. Loyal to builders who transform raw land into residential charm. Developers who see opportunity and add vitality to Tulsa's economy. Bank First serves both enterprise and private lives that need a loyal partner. It's how we help nurture this city's very good life. Bank First. Loyal to Oklahoma. Loyal to you.
Welcome back to the set of The Verdict. Mick Hornett, Kent Myers, and our guests, Susan Winchester and uh, Kerry Watkins, as we discuss uh, the 20th anniversary of the Oklahoma City Memorial. Yeah, I think one of the highlights of uh, that uh, 20th anniversary, or every year, is the marathon. Uh, Susan, talk mm -hmm. to us about that. Well, I think the marathon is such a fun conclusion to what is you know, we're, the remembrance ceremony, a pretty somber week. It's always a Sunday following. We had close to 26,000 runners. I, I think for me, if you're, if you're in the, um, the booth watching the beginning of the race and we ask for 168 seconds of silence to hear that many people go silent, it, it's just, it takes your breath away. That they're there, it's the run to remember, and they're truly there to, to run on behalf of someone or the event that happened. My family really gets into this. We had 24 people that participated this year from my mother, who I'm no longer allowed to tell you how old she was, <laughs> but she's 80-something uh, plus, to my six-month-old niece that all participated in the race. We have our own pasta party the night before, and then they all show up to take part in the race. So many wonderful, wonderful stories come out of that. If, if you have a chance to ever be at the finish line, the people that come across, the firemen in their in their all of their gear, the the people from Fort Sill that run up from pardon me <clears throat> from Fort Sill, complete with their equipment and then run the race. So many people who have help getting there that are in in wheelchairs. There was one young man that came up to probably within three or four feet of the finish line, stood up and walked across the line by himself. Wow. A tremendous accomplishment. I mean, everyone was there to mm -hmm. congratulate them. Everyone has, has a purpose for being there, and I think it shows not only that personal tenacity, but how much they care about Oklahoma City and how much they care about what happened. Kind of wrapped up in the marathon, uh, the long race, are some other shorter races or similar events. Right. What, what um, are those? Children's event, 5K, right. half marathon, and then the full marathon. And the 26,000 number, was that the full marathon? Full marathon. Uh, everything. everything. That everything. was everything. everything. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. That's and it's wonderful. become one of the top races in the country. You know, I, yeah, I had someone tell me last week that it's one of the top feeder races to the Boston Marathon. I mean, it, we'll see what the final sh numbers show, but if, if all went well and the weather was perfect this year, the, the good Lord had mercy on us after <laughs> last year, but uh, we could have qualified 75 folks for the Boston Marathon. It's a, it's a feeder race, and so uh, that's a good number. And mm -hmm. it is, it, Susan said, it's a great it's a great rallying point. We saw the Oklahoma Standard uh, just on the front row were a group of Midwest City firefighters. A woman had gotten hurt a couple miles out and they carried her a couple miles out to the finish line so she could finish. Mm -hmm. And it was a very emotional moment at the, at the finish line that just was remarkable. These firefighters saw someone hurt, knew it wasn't mm -hmm. life-threatening, picked her up and made sure she got to finish the race. Any idea how many people have, have competed in all of them? Uh, all, uh, 15, I guess 15? All marathons. 15 there. We, we gave the, the random all group a special medallion this year, and there were about 43 that had wow. that have run all 15 yeah. of them. And it's wow. a great group of folks. And we had them kind of at the finish line tent and got to meet and visit with some of those folks have been there from the very beginning. It's just great mm -hmm. people who have just followed our, our progress. You've, uh, you you mentioned something earlier, and that is keeping this alive. In other words, you got a whole other generation every year um, of young people who don't really know what occurred there and why it occurred there. Uh, obviously, that's relevant to those of us who, who experienced it and were here at the time. But how do you go about that? I mean, that's, a, that's not only a tremendous responsibility, but a, but a tough one, too, because there's so much, there's so much you could bring into the, t to the subject matter. How do you choose what's relevant to, to, to young people to learn what happened? Well, I think that was part of the, the impetus for the Oklahoma Standard Campaign, which Sam Presti helped us chair this month, and, I mean, the month of April, and we want to keep it going beyond as, as teaching this Oklahoma standard, what, what the world stopped and watched 20 years ago, this great human act of kindness, act of honor, act of service, of how people acted 20 years ago, and ask people to re recommit or to commit for the first time to this living this standard. And I think that's something we got an enormous amount of momentum of, of over the last couple of months of just people saying, we're gonna do this, we're gonna act this out. I think the next thing is to take that into the schools in the fall, making sure that the kids understand that. And as we look at the museum, we, we look at um, you know what what are the stories in that museum that will make it relevant. I mean, the, we were just honored on um, with the, the top museum award with with the area of the responsibility the responsibility theater in the museum, kind of the last area where it takes six questions that are relevant questions to everyday life: forgiveness. Um, 
citizen journalism, when you have a phone, what what pics do you post, what do you not? Um, you know, liberty versus security, uh, death mm -hmm. penalty, all these relevant yeah. questions to today's world. And then we tie them back to the story of the bombing. Hmm. And um, you can watch kids in there that kids don't want to leave. I mean, and as Sam brought the thunder through and he was trying to move them on out. They didn't want to leave this room. They get to vote and have a choice and the host comes back on and says, what about this? And gives you some other alternatives. And so for these 21, 22, 23 year old men, they kept talking about it. I mean, a couple of hours later from practice, you know, he reports they're still talking about these questions of responsibility yeah. that we throw out there. And so I think our, our job is making sure that we put the lessons out there, that we know they're lifelong lessons and somehow tie them back to the story of, of what happened here and make that story relevant to today. Susan, you uh, oversaw as chairman uh, many of the uh, renovations of the museum. Right. Talk to us about a, f a few of them. I've, I have been through the museum before the renovations, not since, and I certainly intend to remedy that. Yes, you, we but, talked about that earlier. I expect right. you to be there very, very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> I think for me, we had so many artifacts that we'd not been at. We, if, you, if you've been involved, you know that they're there and you know what we have, but we hadn't really been able to show them. And we were able to open up new areas, tell more of the story, particularly the justice story. Mm -hmm. You know, we have McVeigh's car now. We have a lot of the information from the trials. For me, it gave um, not only a sense of what happened, but the conclusion of it as well. And then as Kerry was talking about the younger people, we've, we've been able to uh, put into place so many different learning techniques that, that reach all age groups. There are, if you are a reader, there are panels you can read if you want to watch. There are videos, or with the young kids, there are the interactives. And they're, they're just fascinated, they're drawn to it. They're really, they really take in the story in a way that's very, very different than what we were able to offer before. Let me ask you, did you retain the sound portion of the yes. Oklahoma Water Resources Board absolutely. meeting? Absolutely, absolutely. I'll, I'll that never forget that. Yeah. Right. Now, and actually, now we have Lou Claver who was conducting that meeting kind of setting that up outside the hearing room so you know what you're walking into from a first person. I think one of the things we did in the museum added some 700 oral histories to it. So the one thing that's unique about the Memorial Museum is that they, the people tell the story that lived the story. I mean, yeah. you, you hear it first person. And so you hear Lou setting up the story, what they were doing, you hear other water resources employees, you know, talking about the importance of that hearing and why, you know, and they were, they were debating bottled water, you know, bottling groundwater, which you know, huh. it's amazing. Twenty years ago, we all didn't, we weren't carrying <laughs> bottles of water, but <laughs> today that's common. And so, those are lessons. The the technology of, you know, some kids will ask, why didn't you just text your kids and tell them you're okay? Well, <laughs> and so, it gave us an opportunity to put technology in there, phones that were you know as big as this table and things like that. I mean, we there were just artifacts. As Susan said we didn't have on display that we could add. At the time we built the museum the first time, the trials were just wrapping up and so we didn't have any of those documentations and so now we're a repository for all that. Double the size of our archives and it is the greatest one act of archive, I mean the one place for a single act of archives in the country. It is enormous yeah. collection, uh, legal collection, FBI collection, state collection, city collection. I mean it's a, it's a very prominent collection of a story. And, you know, for, for 20, 30 years down the road, that will pay off because researchers can come to one place and get the information they want. About 30 seconds left. Give us the hours that you're open, how people can find out more information. Uh, the museum's mm -hmm. open 9 to 6 uh, every day except Sunday, and it's noon to 6. The last ticket's sold at, at 5 o'clock every day. Um, the outdoor site's open 24 hours a day. And if you haven't been to the museum or you haven't been there lately, it's worth it. It's a new experience. Yeah. It is, and uh, we, our show is also shown in Tulsa, and we, of course, invite people from Tulsa Absolutely. to come down and spend the day and, and, and see the memorial. Many of have, have never been through the, the actual museum themselves. Almost everyone has seen the, the chairs and, right. the, and the, the lawn and the reflecting pool, but not everyone has seen the museum. And some people think they won't want to, but I, I've not had anybody that's gone through it and then regretted it. Right. So I, I urge people that are watching the show, it, it's, it's probably going to be a more positive experience than you might imagine. But do it and then let us know what you think. Susan, thanks so much Thank for, for coming on and for being such a, an important part of what the memorial's uh, reach has become. And Carrie, a great, great Thank job as always Thank in you explaining the, 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 the task ahead of you. Kent and I'll be back with a final word after this.
There are now 11 million of us who live here and work here. I was 15 when I came here six years ago. I raised my family here. I drive my truck to my job every day. The only difference between now and six years ago, I do it legally. I wanted to. Because this is my home. All children deserve a life of hope and love, but sometimes they experience a life of pain, neglect, and abuse. When that happens, each child deserves all the quality, assistance, and representation that can be offered in our legal system. For more information, call 23CHILD. Oklahoma Lawyers for Children, helping to bring hope and love back to the lives of abused children. Mom and dad to me. I think for us, once we got started and we began to see the tremendous need um, just within our state, um, it really was just a calling for us. The blessings far outweigh any obstacles that we've faced. You will always be mom and dad to me. The Journal Record is pleased to be a sponsor of The Verdict. The Journal Record, since 1903, the best source of Oklahoma business news and legal information. And for almost 30 years, Oklahoma political, government, and business leaders have turned to the McCarville Report for accurate, reliable, inside information. Visit the McCarville Report online. Welcome back to the set of The Verdict. Mick Cornett and Kent Myers wrapping up the show on the 20th anniversary of the Oklahoma City bombing and the memorial. The memorial is in good hands of very professional folks running it, and it's quite a thing to see. Uh, you'll come away moved. Yeah, we have some website information, oklahomacitynationalmemorial.org. That's oklahomacitynationalmemorial.org. And then we have a website. would love for you to go there and talk yeah. about a show you'd like to see, and that's theverdict.tv. For Kent Myers, I'm Mick Cornett. We'll see you next time.